Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Cameron, and uh, for the nice invitation, and thank everybody for your um, for the nice workshop, which I witnessed now for the last few days. Uh, is the microphone working? Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk about in the next days about the traditional Boltzmann inversion. Today it's really about the fundamentals, what the method is, and how to do it. Then tomorrow is special about some of the pitfalls and how to avoid them, and on Friday largely about one recent example we have worked on. Uh, this afternoon I will talk about my other side, which is my physics side in my research talk. So you give a bit an idea. Um, what I put down here on the bottom is two book chapters, um, which largely cover the material of the first two talks. The first one is look state point dependence. That's in the big um, course graining book edited by Greg Worth a few years ago, which probably a lot of you know. The other one is in Reviews in Computational Chemistry, which is a book series run by ACS, and um, that's um, edited by Kenny Lipkowitz. So if anybody is interested, I of course um, can get you a copy of these reviews. I often get the question where I actually is Davis, so it's on the, it's almost on the west coast. We are um, just outside of Sacramento, about 80 miles to the northeast of San Francisco. So we are about four time zones behind in Davis to here. Um, first, I want to thank a few people whom I stole quite a lot of the slides from, or had my students make them <laughs> over the last few years. Um, a lot of the slides I actually made by Investor by Ramoglu. She graduated two weeks ago, is uh, just accepted the position at Ismail Institute of Technology in Turkey, where she will be an assistant professor starting early next year. Um, then Florian Müller-Blatte, who was my actual PhD advisor, I was, as Jim said, Kurt's group, but um, Florian was a senior scientist at that time and is now professor of physical chemistry at Darmstadt. Um, Bing Trang was working with me and especially Adam Mollet over the um, kind of 2010 around. He did all the work related to coarse graining of organic photovoltaics, which I largely will talk, talk about on Friday. And Chi was actually my very first PhD student who did a lot of the work on the polystyrene. You will see a lot of the examples. She got her PhD five years ago and is now after some moving at Western Digital. So, this is the big problem we all face in cost graining. We can easily do simulations here of what you see on the left. So, there are many codes available and we have about a nanometer time scale. And what you really want to do is ideally something that we see on the right. We want to predict really macroscopic properties. And how do we get there? Of course, not in one step, but we essentially, what I talk about is a little baby step getting first from here to here. <laughs> and thinking this, of course, is logarithmic. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't see even, even the step here. <laughs> so, and here, of course, all information is accessible. And on the right hand side, there is no direct molecular information, but we can of course measure a lot of thermodynamic properties. And that is what we really would like to do. Um, what I'm talking about in the next few days is really largely structure thermodynamics. What Monica was just talking about is dynamics. That is in the case of IBI even worse than in force matching. So we have some ideas and we have worked on that to some extent. And I will perhaps talk a little bit about that, but Actually, we'll talk about structure and to some extent thermodynamics. So, our, this is kind of a big idea of multi scaling, which was brought up. This is a slide which is very similar, comes from Florian Müller Blatter's idea. So, we have on the left hand side, we have quantum chemistry, then we have the atomistic simulations, which we are all very familiar with. Then we have and coarse graining in this case means systematically coarse grained models which know which polymer or which molecule they represent. And then there are more generic models which just represent polymer. And especially in the polymer field, they are very abundant, which means they get you all the right scaling laws, but they don't get you the properties of a specific material. They get you the property of how a polymer in general behaves, especially as a function of chain length, as a function of and all of that. For that, a lot of the generic models are actually very well. Um, I don't talk about them 
um, if anybody is interested, we can talk about that um, offline, but I'll talk about it in the lectures. I'm talking about how to get essentially from here to here with one specific method and how this method works. Of course, the basic idea of coarse graining is kind of dealing with to make everything faster, larger, and larger. And at the same, this is of course only possible if we degree um, if we decrease the numbers of degrees of freedom. So otherwise, we would have to increase time steps, and that would lead very quickly to significant problems. But that will not work. Reducing degrees of freedom actually has another advantage, which is often overlooked. It gets the system much easier handleable. So if you have a huge atomistic trajectory, it's extremely hard sometimes to get the correct observables out to get the correct what is the interesting degrees of freedom. And if you have now a time if you have now a model called graining which has perhaps two, three orders of magnitude less interaction sites in the in the big case, then it's much easier to analyze that and to find the correct observables within it. But that actually is also on the analysis side you have an advantage sometimes in the uh, in coarse graining. Of course, the problem is you have to make sure the degrees of freedom are important. That means what do you keep, what do you die. Uh, so you have to try to find the natural separation into things which are global and local. Of course, we want to keep the, the slow and global ones. We want to dump the fast and, um, global, uh, fast and local ones. All these examples are bond vibrations, common care, diffusion, a bit different story, hydrogen bonding. We normally have to dump it, although we not necessarily want, especially in a lot of the biomolecular modeling. We would like to keep hydrogen bonding, but there's no way to do so. There is something like membrane fluctuations, especially this afternoon when I'm talking about biomembrane modeling. Membrane fluctuations which lead to the mechanical behavior of the membrane. They are absolutely essential and we cannot dump them. So, a bit more specific now. What I'm doing is mapping models. So in that case, coarse graining, specific systematic coarse graining is only meaningful if the two systems you're talking about are to some extent the same system. Otherwise, obviously, um, we cannot say the one is the coarse grained version of the other. So that means at least for the interesting large scale properties, we have to have a correspondence between them. And that is what this whole thing is about. Normally, as I already alluded to, uh, coarse grade model tries to either reproduce the statics or the thermodynamics or the dynamics of the, of the atomistic system. We normally can combine the statics and the thermodynamics. Getting into the dynamics is very tricky, as Monica just talked in um, before. So there are obviously some of the limits. No mapping works for everything. And another caveat, if you do a coarse grain simulation, don't try to analyze it at the shortest possible time. That is meaningless. So time scales which are coarse grain time scales, time steps, why do it? There yeah, you need the atomistic model. So you have to be an order, two orders of magnitude above really the length scales you are looking at. So kind of the bond to bond, the bond to bond vibrations on the coarse grained level, they are actually meaningless. The only way they only meaningful part of that is that they keep the polymer together. That the polymer doesn't fall apart, that you have a polymer, that you don't have a bunch of monomers. But the actual vibration there doesn't mean much. It is actually, if you will see later, it's a combination of atomistic bond angle vibrations and dihedrals. So there is no real physical meaning to that. So if you come to the length scale of two or three monomers, it becomes different. So the objective of the comes is really from the polymer world and the examples I'm talking about are all polymer examples. So it's the simulation of large scale polymer melts and polymer solutions. That's really what you want to do. And especially the big advantage, I bring that right from the beginning, we can do the optimization on oligomers, on short polymers, and then we can up 
to long chains. That is the big advantage which led to the success of IBI had over the last decade or so. Because um, I don't know how familiar you are with Polymer, so who has worked on Polymers before? Okay, not many. Um, is that if you go from that typically simulation time, if you do it right, scales at least with the square, if not with the cube of polymer chain length. Because the relaxation times go up, you need to avoid um, that the molecule sees itself through periodic boundary conditions, so you need to have longer polymers, you need to have more of them. So the simulation becomes easily intractable. I did once about the envelope calculation for a system which we had, um, which is a mixture of organic photovoltaic screens. So we wanted to do something like one millimeter thing, I think for a millisecond. Millimeter. What do you think, how long would that take to simulate fully atomistically one millimeter cubed for about a second? In, with, using the K computer, which is the currently fastest computer. Twice the age of the universe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I don't think anybody has time to do their PhD at that time. <laughs> So, obviously, that's completely out of the question. We are 10 to the 17 off there. So, what we want to do is this. This is an atomistic snapshot of actually a simulation of polyisoprene. Just, you don't need to know what polyisoprene is. You will see a few pictures of it anyway. Um, that was one of the fir very first polymers which was used in IBI. So. You see here a lot of carbons, which are the gray ones, hydrogens, which are the white ones, and isopolymers, green, yellow, and red. These are actually the same polymer. You see that this goes behind and comes out on the other end. And what we really want is we want to go from this mess to this slightly less complicated mess, which is where we have larger balls and only a few for each chain. If we go to the idea of solutions, we want to activate a bit of solvent all together. And we want to go from this is actually a snapshot of polyisoprene and And so we want to that and have the, the solvent in kind of a mean field representation. So we don't have explicit solvent, but we need the solvent because it has on the polymer. But that's really where we are going. So what we want to do, we want to do explicit. This is again polyisoprene. This is a, uh, 15 mil of trans 14. And this is 15 bits down there because we normally do kind of a one, one, one monomer to one bead mapping. Sometimes one monomer to three beads. And when we come to polyisoprene, it's even more. Or it's very, very small, very, very simple polymer. Polyisoprene. We have two monomers to one mapping. That's how to choose the mapping point second. So we say two models represent the same system if they yield the same on the longer of the two. You see, I cannot analyze this on this length. Analyze this on this length. And that's what we We take the atomic simulation, we pretend it's a coarse grain simulation, analyze it, take the that's the idea. That's the idea of what we uh, saw in force matching over the last few days. So, from now on, the atomistic model is defined correct. Will inherit. The cross grain model will represent truthfully the atomistic structure. The, structure does, the cross grain model hopefully does right as well, but the atomistic structure does wrong. The model inevitably will do wrong. Well, the typical properties we are talking about here are radial distribution functions. That's for the non-bond. Do the example which you will do on Friday afternoon. You will do butanol, a small molecule. We don't have radial, we don't have radial degrees of freedom. Um, non-bond degrees of freedom. On top of that, polymers we typically have, the structure, you may have the structure factor. We have, may have bond angle distributions on the coarse grained level. We may have dihedral angle distributions on the coarse grained level. We may have bonds distributions on the coarse grained level. 
but the latter only try to get away, away from by choosing the right mapping. So this is actually a, true, a real example. This is polythiophen, actually P3HT, one of the, it's kind of the fruit fly polymer for all of with a fullerene. Atomistic simulation, 12 hours of P3HT with C60. This is 6 nanometers cubed. System. So you get the system basically very similar, but all the little details are gone. But this is really what the whole IBI is about. We go from this to this, and now we can go here instead of 6 nanometers on the side, we can go 25 nanometers on the side. 100 where we can do. And that is where a lot of the real questions, the mesoscale morphological questions are. That's where we want to get to. So, this is the first sketch how things are looking like. So what we do is we have the polymer, so connected, and we have some Presentation. That's the blue one. It's kind of a sketch of P3HT. We have P3HT has a few more interaction sites in reality, but basically assume this blue polymer, coarse grain this blue polymer. One way to do this is okay. We put somewhere here in the middle a red dot. This red dot represents now this here. This may or may not be an isotropic distribution. We'll come to that. We talked a little bit about that um, with Monica already. Um, and we may choose actually the red dot that we get a largely isotropic distribution that can be done in some cases. So now, if you do the atomistic coarse grain simulation, the only thing you see is obviously this speed, this speed spring model of the red dots. If you would now go to a real, what people call real spring model, then you would really forget about all of this. You would have a, a spring and you would have a Lana Jones speed here, and then you get to the generic model with the polymer. But that polymer wouldn't know what the mystic model is below it. What we want to do is we want to have a bond distribution, a bond angle distribution, as well as a non bond distribution, which represent a kind of mean field kind of interaction. That's the fundamental idea. The point is that it will not be a potential energy anymore. This is a mixture of free energy. It's a potential energy on the coarse grained level with the free energy from all the, the uh, outintegrated degrees of freedom on the level. So it's a mixture of the two. It's thermodynamically a very peculiar energy. So, basically, if you think about it, this is an idea which comes from the right? mapping from the atomic to the coarse grain model. You have a natural transformation and you find an operator which brings all this atomic configuration in a coarse grain configuration. And the way we make it in IBI normally, we make this as a linear operator. That means all these positions here are a linear combination of the positions here. So that means R, a coarse grained position, which is Ri, is some operator acting on a R. And what this, it's a sum over some prefactors times positions on this side. This is a linear operator. This is in that idea, it's simple linear algebra. That is what leads us from here to here. Not restricted, and you'll come to that. That this has to do with the center of mass or the center of geometry of our atomistic monomers. We are completely free to 
how we choose DC. In IBI, we are totally free. There is no way. There, and there are a number of different ways which leads to the point is it should be a linear operator. So, how do we do this? This is one of the very first examples. This was not that right. It was still done with a optimizer, with a simplex optimizer. Uh, and Maya, people are doing a PhD. So I have the same, like uh, Monica, here, I have on the last page the, the all the references which, which refer to this. So, that's no comment. The first thing you can do is okay, do one to one mapping. Hold at least onto one interaction, right? And in this case, this was a, where we tried to do it with um, a fully um, with kind of a generalized Leonard Chen, not a numerical potential. You will come to numerical potential. This is just a 6, 8, 10, 12 potential. And you see the, core, the atomistic <coughs> um, potent, potential lead, led to this radial distribution. And the best we could go on the coarse grain of this. It's very simple. It's not an anisotropic, it's really anisotropic. So it doesn't, it didn't really work. In this case, we switched to a one to three. There we said, okay, we have one, the carbon cube in the middle, and then we have to do side things, and we force the side things to have the same the opposite thing. And then we could in this case even get away with simple Leonard Jones speeds and get a perfect representation of the other. But this already gives you an idea that the two things yeah. It's not all repulsive. It's not. I, no, I don't say that's still not a positive. <laughs> you say it's negative, sure. So if you come to polymers, again, the pH looks like me and this is already way too bad. Here, a thiophene ring with a sulfur in there, and then you have these side groups which the polymerization direction is along the thiophene. So, in this case, we did the interaction one representing the ring, and two are representing the ring. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, what you see here is polyisoprene. This is a monomorph polyisoprene if you don't care for hydrogen. This is how it works problems in one trans one four PI are looking like and there you actually get away with one interaction. It would suggest normally that you put it somewhere here, your very bad choice will come back to that. The ideal choice is to put it here. Okay. That's the question. Where do we put our mapping points? This is again, this is now a dimer of trans 14 polyisoprene. And that's one of the standard, one of the first systems which has coarse grained with IBI. So, this is, so if you look at that, is that this is the real monomer here with some additional eight hydrogen, which we really don't care about. This is a atom. And normally we would say, okay, we go here or the center of mass. Say we just go in the middle of this double bond. We, go here, we get this as our one length distribution of the coarse grain scale between the red ones. P, one distribution of coarse grain scale.
because these are different contributions. We can assume that contributions are the same. So then you have don't want that. You really try to avoid that. So, oh, if you map the true monomers, that's the problem. If you go to this very strange object, which is really kind of, you go exactly on the middle between two monomers. So you take, you put your coarse grain exactly here. What you get is this thing, which is actually one perfect peak. Narrow perfect peak. Any and it's just so we either put it here or we put it here. If you now look at this, if you're here, if you're going from here to here, you have three Relatively take around here, around here, and around here. And that leads to this very solution. On the other hand, if you're here, effectively you have largely this double bond. This double bond keeps everything down. This double bond cannot rotate. You would break a pi bond. So double bonds don't rotate. They wobble. This is and in this particular case, polyisoprene, and what does a double bond do in addition to not rotate? All these five atoms. An sp2 hybridization on C2 and on C3. The sp2 hybridization is an flame. So essentially, polyisoprene is a monomer. Let's now take this red, this blue here, the same chemical formula. So then, a locally spherical entity from which you can do much easier optimizations. Another example, polystyrene, this is the work of G. Um, you see all of these different bond length distributions. Interaction site. It is very quick and everything. I Nico van an optimization. <coughs> this one I'll give you a first kind of a idea of how it works and then we go into the detail of the different steps. Some initial parameters. looks like it's The equivalent. So ideally, if you want to do this all automatically, you have to. You have to analyze your system. I know everything is nicely equilibrated. If yes, do 
a simulation and you analyze the simulation. Compare to the atomistic data. If you're not there, you have to use the optimizer. And the optimizer we are using, using is the IBI. There are other optimizers out there. There are simple optimizers. There is a out of the French Petroleum Institute. Um, thermodynamic fluctuations in the simulation. You know, of optimizers. You get a set of new parameters, you go around this loop as many times as needed until the data. So this is this, this is the main. If you want to optimize, you have to have you have one number. And this number is your perfect, everything higher. So you have a positive semi definite number. The typical is a function as a function of parameters is typically the difference between your measured parameter to the target, maybe rating function. And then you square it, you take the root of the whole function. That's if you have discrete observables. Well, and every evaluation of this penalty function is a whole equilibration simulation. And analysis. You don't have any way to have an analytic way to calculate this function. This AI of P. That's parameters. Because okay, we have these parameters, we get this result. So that's what we know. Target function, we don't have a target parameters. So now we have what we then do is we integrate, maybe with a weighting function, a different function possible. Sometimes maybe an exponential that we In the large scale interaction, okay. but that is only optimal. Now, what is I? I is you simulate model. You either guess from a similar problem if you have four, or you take between force. Distribution function, you take minus k use that as your starting potential, and you do a simulation with that potential. Then you do the simulation, you end observable, rate of distribution function, if you want to determine the discrepancy between half and what you want. Why if you take the why if you take your Boltzmann inverted RDM? Exactly to is not is the mixture of a potential. We wouldn't have that. Then 
Make a Atomistic all the app. And this is the atomistic all the app. You count the You go on the Our course brain. This minus K. And uh, 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 um, And you may get something like this blue one. Now, at every point, we measure the difference. It is reality not effects for this point from the potential here or here. You just okay. get another potential, hopefully. Ideally, there's a blue and a purple line on top of it. The black one is the, the very early optimization, and you see successively, I think this is optimizations one, five. The minimal unit, and you get back to what? This force.
Then we choose a mapping scheme, as we discussed before. So before you do anything, that's the second step. If you are the Lisic simulation, then you choose a mapping scheme. Or you, of course you can do that now. That doesn't matter. Then you calculate the bond, angle, dihedral distributions, and the RDFs between what we typically call the super atoms. Super atoms are the four strength sites, they are the four strength sites. We call them super atoms. That are our target distribution. Then we have to obtain the initial guesses for the interaction of atoms. And that is the optimal inverse of the target distributions. Then you look at them a bit, and you may need to smooth them. So you do a spline, and you shift the minima to zero. You have to expand linearly to zero for the non bonded potentials. The point is, because if you look at your RDF, your RDF is down the RDF looks like this. That's zero is here. What do we do here? Because if you also invert that, you get something like that's like this. And then this is log zero. How does it exist? So what we do is we linearly expand this up to zero. So we have to expand the table down to zero, so we do that typically linearly, which means it's constant. A high constant force, if they ever get that hard together, they will move on. That's what we do. Yes, so that may be a different, different ways to choose it. That's a that simulator, how it looks like, and then, and then you have the RDF. This is real RDF, in this case to be polystyrene tolerant in uh, mixed simulation. And this green is the Boltzmann inverse, and we chosen it normally at the minimum is at zero. That's the Then we set up the cost rate system. And we take as the initial configuration our map atmosphere. One typically a map configuration at the end of the atmosphere. That is our setup. Then we typically do this um, then form the first iteration. This is the most one that we tried in the in the workshop. And typically we do this in the NDP also. Um, so it comes that of course there are there sometimes are issues with the pressure type. And we calculate say the bond distribution. And then we have here the merit function, which is integral bonds minus target bonds, and then we normally normalize that by the target bonds. Or you just have normalized the whole system. Uh, so in your initial configuration, you started with simulation and meeting Yes. Because because you want to have the atomistic simulation at the correct density, now you're starting at the correct density and at the moment, and for the moment fix it at that correct density. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the atomistic simulation isn't at the correct density after the end of the density. And now we are at the moment fixing it, fixing to be at the correct density. Because there are so that we correct the potential. So we have a difference here. The difference of the RDF to the target the 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 may look like this. Boltzmann inverse, we have a correction potential. So the I plus first potential is the I potential plus this one, there's a KT, there's an AI. That AI is essentially a function factor which you may or may not use. What you can do if you have really a lot of computer time, you run with different function factors in parallel. You see which one of them is the best, and you use that, that, that for the next one. As I said, the whole thing is an optimization procedure which is inspired by thermodynamics. So we can get away with trying to evict, trying to not follow the full thermodynamics. It is a thermodynamically inspired optimization. I 
and you continue to the um, kilo of merit times this to those points. So that means on average one is not good. From the difference. So if you start normally with this point, you may or may not need that. Then you do the whole thing for the angles. And then you do the non bond and perhaps in the end you can do this. That's the problem is now again. Comes exactly back to your question. If you do that, you get a function which reproduces the structure. But you may be wrong. Question is yes. You, you might may not say, okay, that's strange because there's handles in theorem. Um, handles in theorem says there is one unique. For every RBF, there's one unique two body function which is unique to that RBF. So, the point is, Handelson's theorem is not violated because you have different cutoffs and you have different numerical instabilities. If you would be perfect, if you would have an infinite cutoff and everything, and you didn't have a grid between, say, 0.01 to 0.02, then there would be really only one, and you never would have the issue. Gets the pressure a bit off. So the bit, I mean plus minus half a bar. Um, you may know that that's in terms of simulations, not that bad. What you then typically do at the long range part here, that is this very almost zero anything, you might add a very slight pressure, or very, very slight degree of pressure slide to a very slight perspective part, which leads, if you integrate that, so you add this pressure correction, which is typically some three factor times one minus r of r, so it's slightly within the potential force, and that constant force also then gives you a So, summary of fundamentals. Iterative force manipulations, systematic and static procedures. Cross grade force field is not a potential energy. It is an MD potential, but not a potential energy. But it's a mixture of potential and free energy. It always relies on an atomistic asymmetry. Uh, it's very effective for polymers. The big drawback is this state function. That means technically you have to do a new ground, not only for every new polymer. Every new state of So you can have temperature dependent, you have concentration dependent. And that's largely what we'll talk about today. What, how does that actually look like? You may even run into the case that, for example, if you do this polystyrene, you get this at the end of Kelvin, you cool this polystyrene down, normally you should run into, I mean, did that form of 50 Kelvin, which is roughly exactly the same temperature of PS. You cool it down, and it can. Yes, into the glass form, or it should form a glass at about 400 Kelvin. Then crystallize the PA. So obviously that was not right. Why is that? Any idea why that happens? You're very, very close. The main point is the only the point is only got the relevant configuration at state point That means at other state points, other configurations are relevant, but we never sample points in our atmospheric simulation. So we never could fit against them, so we will never be able to do it. That is exactly what people, what people are going to. It's kind, kind of an explicit state point dependent potential with a predicted state point dependent. Yes, that's, where they are, that's one of the areas where people are going to. So these are the references.
there is a significance, especially the things that he talks about in Hong Kong. So therefore, um, normally, say the bomb sending is a convergent feature. That's not. Um, that was Zezhi Bernard of, of Peste, who really looked into things like that in detail. And the point is that the Tahitos and the non bondists they are both soft. So KT is, is, is an important number in their case, whereas for bondists and for angles it's not a big number, so therefore it doesn't matter. But as the two are similar in size, we essentially, what we, did, what we sometimes often do is we then do one non bondist step, one Tahitos step, one non bondist step, one Tahitos step. And that's also um, becomes even trickier if you have heat. And that's well, I have lots of things I'm talk about tomorrow. And we did polyisomer polystyrene a few years ago. There we ran especially into this issue. How do you do that? Because now we have three of them. And how in which order do you optimize the three of them? 